Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan McGuire, Manager of Professional Development at ACCE, and I am happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Today we'll hear from David Brown, Ann Brannigan, and Sarah Moylan of the Greater Omaha Chamber, who will tell us about the Chamber's innovative and out-of-the-box strategies to attract, retain, and develop talent for targeted industries. Winner of the 2015 Chamber of the Year Award in Category 5 through the vision of its Prosper Omaha campaign, the Chamber focuses on initiatives that increase the number of individuals living and working in the region, meet business needs for talent, and align workforce partners to build an even more cohesive regional system. Before I turn the program over to David, Ann, and Sarah, we do have a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first, attendees are in listen-only mode during the webinar to avoid background noise. Uh, second, we will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please ask them using the question function of the webinar. You'll see the question box on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Just type in your question, and I'll read the question to our panelists. If we run out of time and don't get to your question, or if you have a question that you would prefer to discuss with the panelists individually offline, please feel free to contact them directly. Their contact information will be included in the presentation. And third, this webinar is being recorded and should be up on the ACC website on the ACC University webpage within the next one to two business days. I'll also post the presentation slides along with the webinar recording. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, David Brown is President and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber. David came to Omaha in 2003, backed by 30 years of experience in economic development and chamber management. He leads the organization and serves the chamber's mission to champion a thriving business community and prosperous region with bold vision, comprehensive understanding, and contagious enthusiasm. Anne Brannigan is the Chamber's Senior Vice President of Innovative Services. Anne has been with the Chamber for over 25 years in a variety of capacities. She's curr she currently leads a division of dynamic professionals who are responsible for the organization's membership, events, marketing, research, and technology efforts. She also managed the submission process for the Chamber of the Year application. And Sarah Moylan is the Chamber's Senior Director of Talent and Workforce. Sarah is responsible for studying talent and workforce needs in the Omaha metro area and developing a comprehensive strategy to grow, recruit, and retain a workforce that enables companies to grow and prosper. Her efforts play a critical role, enhancing chamber efforts to create a strong business climate, pursue investment and jobs for the region, and strengthen leaders and the community. So thanks to all of you for being with us today and I will pass the presentation over to you. Well, thank you, Susan. <clears throat> this is David Brown with the Omaha Chamber, here again with Ann Brannigan and uh, Sarah Moylan. And thanks to all of you who are attending today. This is really quite an honor for us to be able to present to you uh, a piece of uh, what we think um, was a contributor towards us being named one of the Chambers of the Year this past year. So for a brief overview of who we are, uh, we're a large metro chamber with about uh, 3,200 members and an $8 million annual budget. We have both the chamber and the economic development function under our mission. We're home to a two-state, nine-county economic development partnership uh, that has a five-year strategy that we'll talk about here a little bit more in a second. We operate as one organization under this, the vision and mission and values that you see on the screen. Uh, we take very seriously the role of a catalyst organization. Uh, we believe that we are out here to uh, engage the community in activities and conversations that will cause positive change to occur. And we tell our board that every, every time we meet and we engage our staff every month in this conversation. Uh, and we even warn people that we hire that if they're not comfortable with change, this is probably not a good place to be because uh, we're all about change somehow or another, whether it's within our organization or within the community. Our mission is a new one. Uh, we've, we had a much simpler mission, I think, before. It was just about investment and capital investment, um, excuse me, job creation and capital investment, but we realized that we do more than that. And so this mission of champion, championing a thriving business community and prosperous region 
through leadership and collaboration really respects talks it respects what we do and how we do it and the role we try and play in the community. And then the values really reflect how we operate in this organization. We're very family friendly. Uh, we are, we, as a matter of fact, we just were announced as a winner of a Gallup a Great Workplace Award for our engaged workplace. Uh, we try to do everything with high passion, a vision for the future, and um, settling for excellence only when perfection isn't possible. So uh, we, we live under these things every single day. Um, for us, our Talent and Workforce Initiative really came as a result of conversations with our economic development clients and our members over the past really decade. For the longest time, we did economic development somewhat separately from our workforce development effort. Um, at first, we worried more about the structure. Was our workforce investment board acting the way it needed to be? Did we need to change that? Were the state job training programs consistent with the kind of industries that we were supporting? Uh, but as we got further and further into a more diversified economy, an economy that has been very strong over the past really 15 years or so, um, even during the recession, we hit about 5% unemployment was the worst that we've got. Now we're just a shy over 2.5%. And as you're playing in those numbers, as you all know, the labor force availability gets more difficult. The uh, ability to hire all the kinds of people that you need becomes more difficult. And as we started quantifying the problem, we realized that economic development and talent development were really something that needed to be discussed hand in hand. So when we completed our last five-year plan, um, a strategy called Prosper Omaha, uh, we included talent development as one of our economic development strategies. And I'm a firm believer that it was at the addition of the talent initiative uh, that enabled us to raise about $24 million for the five-year period um, of running this Prosper Omaha strategy. And we added about 125 or 130 new investors to the mix, too, because, again, we were willing to pay attention to the, the talent piece of the agenda and, and realize that there are gaps in our workforce where we have uh, more pipeline availability than we have jobs, but other places where we have far more jobs than we have people in the pipeline. And we needed to somehow create a process where we could fill all the job needs of our employers and our potential economic development clients. So we have about 60 staff and about 800 or so volunteers and partners who drive our five organizational goals that are listed on this slide. So we organize our strategic plan under each of these goals. So each of these goals has a set of very specific objectives and tactics that are measured both quarterly and annually. And we present those measurements to our board and then publish those to our members on a regular basis. Um, for years, our members and clients have talked about various workforce needs, and so you can see that we've identified growth and recruitment and retention of talent and workforce needs for the future as one of our key goals. Um, we have uh, an interrelated work program here, so our economic development strategy uh, is linked with our overall chamber strategy, and many of the things that we do on, say, the chamber side of the house are done to be supportive of the economic development work uh, that we do. So most of our public policy initiatives are identified from things that we learn from economic development clients or from our existing companies. All of our talent work is informed by the input that we get from our existing companies and economic development clients. Our competitive business environment, again, is all informed from comments that we get from the economic development side of the house. And aside from the expectation that we're going to be doing great member programs, events, and services and provide really current information and operating the Chamber with Excellence, which are clear the Chamber side of our function, everything else that we do has some direct correlation to the economic development business that, that we are in here. So with that in mind, I may turn this over to Sarah to have her talk specifically about how we have approached our work at growing, recruiting, and retaining talent. And then note that both Ann and I and Sarah will be available at the, the end of Sarah's discussion to answer whatever questions you might have. So I'd like you to meet Sarah. Moore. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, when we set out to kind of plan the agenda for this webinar, um, 
you know, it's our, our intent to provide you an inside look at our process and what we've been going through over the past couple of years, as David talked about. Um, and I'm going to provide some key specific takeaways, programs, initiatives that we have unfolded in our region that have helped us um, start to accomplish some of our goals and meet businesses' needs. Um, and then also, I will dive a little bit deeper into one area of focus, tech talent, and that is a recent strategy that we have um, aggressively unfolded and begin to initiate some work on in order to meet some five-year and longer-term um, strategic goals with. But I have to pause for a second and say um, I saw the registration list for this webinar and it's a pleasure to be talking with a lot of colleagues that lead talent initiatives at chambers and economic development groups across the country. Um, and part of me wants to say uh, this is a support group. <laughs> We're all in this together. Um, there's a few key takeaways that I want to provide you from my experience. One would be is that each and every city, region, and community has unique characteristics that are sort of different ingredients in this entire recipe. And if walking away with, um, you know that those are important factors that need to be considered. Um, nothing can, can be completely replicated or duplicated without taking into consideration the unique factors of a community. Um, the second is that I've found, and I think many people would agree, um, talent development, talent attraction, and just meeting the needs of businesses is a moving target. It will, we will probably never get to a point where we will throw our hands up and say we've accomplished our goals, we're done now, and we're going to go take a vacation. Um, it is a moving target. and so. My point with that is, is with anything I talk, we have to we have to design and develop really flexible, nimble programs that can almost consistently respond to the needs that pop up in our community. And that's not to say that we can't begin to develop some kind of sound practices and procedures that we continue to use. But I will tell you, even throughout the past three years and working in this space, we have changed, innovative, rethought, retooled, redesigned um, each and every one of these things we're going to talk about. And so um, that's a little bit of advice from where where I feel like I've been, we've been. And last but not least, if, um, if you zone out early or, or tune off, I would say the one piece that I would say make sure you take with you is to invest in relationships. Um, we don't have the information we have and we haven't rolled out the work that we've done without people being invested in what we're doing and hearing constant feedback and information from our business and education communities and workforce development communities and partners. Um, so if you can do one thing and do one thing well, it's to invest in those relationships so you're really ingrained with all of those partners in your region. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the process that has unfolded for us. So first and foremost, um, as David talked about, when Prosper Omaha began to take shape a few years ago, we utilized a variety of resources to help tell us where that strategy needed to help us land. It was an exciting time, and what we envisioned here at the Chamber was that we would be um, on par with some things, needing to readjust other things, and continue to, to move forward and make progress. Um, we worked with an organization called Market Street. Many of you are probably familiar with Market Street. They were a wonderful tool to us where they came in and interviewed um, hundreds of stakeholders in our community and they also uh, analyzed hundreds of data points, um, labor market data and otherwise um, economic data that helped them really get a firm handle on the greater Omaha community. and. Um, and, and how we were doing, so to speak. And what we um, what we found from that Market Street assessment and that work with um, that consultant was was we were doing some things pretty well. Our economy was growing, but from every stakeholder, from nearly every survey and outreach and data point that they analyzed, what what they found was a need to focus on talent. We had done a pretty good job in our region, actually a, a very good job of growing business jobs and investment, um, and the focus hadn't been as great on developing talent and attracting talent, 
and we were sitting in a place where we needed to ramp up um, our talent efforts in a major way to be meeting that need. So that, that was some good information. It said talent, hey, start focusing on talent, but we needed to know a little bit more about what that looks like. And so we've been using different tools throughout that time, like MZ, to help us really dive a little bit deeper into like a workforce and industry uh, analysis um, to help us tell more. But that's only half of the, the puzzle or half of the conversation. Um, like I talked about earlier, uh, one of our key tools in our work is to have a variety of uh, stakeholders and groups that we can meet on a regular basis to provide feedback. Um, throughout the time of developing our strategy uh, a few years ago, I probably hosted uh, focus groups two or three times a week to meet with different groups of talent, whether it was senior HR leadership, young professionals, diverse talent, career education leaders in our schools, post-secondary leaders, um, really anybody and everybody that could provide us feedback on what their needs were, what they were hearing, and what direction we should go. One kind of tactical um, initiative out of that is a group that we call the landing crew. And the landing crew consists of about 50 to 60 corporate recruiters that um, their job is to help recruit for that company. They wake up every day and look for talent to fill positions and find positions. And why I wanted to highlight this for everybody was that this group of individuals um, nearly has a, a constant pulse on, on the labor market. They not only understand their businesses' needs, but they are also out there talking to talent on the street, so to speak, at college fairs, career fairs. So they're hearing from talent. And what we learned um, from this group was that they could provide us consistent information about why people were or were not accepting jobs and how businesses were able to match skills with um, the talent that was available in the market. So that's our landing crew, and we can meet them on a regular basis to, um, to, to provide that information. So all of that data collection, interviews, input from stakeholder, stakeholders led us to understand a couple of key things. One, um, our region is blessed with unemployment. So there's, there's no hiding the fact that low unemployment rates are a blessing in a community. However, however, they can also create some really strong challenges when you're trying to find workers for businesses. Um, it just makes a really tight labor market. The second kind of element that we wanted to look into in unemployment is your labor participation rate. And this added an additional element of challenge for us was that we have a very high labor participation rate in our region. A high labor participation rate means the larger the size of your workforce, it means that you have a large size of workforce compared to the overall population. And Greater Omaha um, ranks second in the nation in overall labor participation rate. So by and large, of those people living in our community, most of them are working. Um, second key finding, um, the second and third really tie together. Um, I'm going to touch on actually educated workforce um, first. What we found, um, and it was interesting diving into the data, was that for the greater Omaha region, um, we have a very highly educated workforce. So um, of a population adult age and above, so of the population living in Omaha that's 25 and older, we have over 90%, actually 91% have a high school degree or better. So people, um, by and large, have that high school diploma or better, some kind of a, a certificate or degree after that. Um, and 34% have a bachelor's degree or higher. So that told us that our education system is working to, to some degree and to a very large degree. Um, and we're an educated workforce. So. Um, <clears throat> That told us part of the scenario. And then the second piece was, is um, if you've been in workforce development or talent development for a while, you've probably heard of the term um, skills gap, where basically you have a gap in the skills of your workforce enabled, enabling them to obtain employment. And we didn't necessarily find that here in our, in our workforce. What we found instead was a little bit more of a skills mismatch mismatch. So the data and information helped show us that we were educating talent, that we were complete, we had high completion rates out of post-secondary programs. People were finishing high school and college and people were entering the workforce. But 
sometimes we had surplus of talent sitting in these skilled areas that we didn't necessarily have jobs for. So I'll get into this a little bit more to come, but um, it was a mismatch between our education system and, and basically where our job growth had ended up. So those were important factors in kind of our discovery phase of, of this process. So we took that anecdotal information, we took that feedback from stakeholders, and we also looked at the data. And what we were able to say was there were two main big picture strategies that we needed to focus on for a talent strategy. One was to kind of address that skills mismatch, but it was around developing talent. So we needed to do a better job of aligning our business sectors, our, our growing industries, and our targeted industries that were growing with then the educational programs that were providing students these opportunities to get engaged, to choose a career, to then stay here for their post-secondary opportunities, and then to end up in a in a career and a job here in our region. So it was really all about how are we developing talent and do a better job of developing talent for what we have here. And the second piece is around attracting talent. Since we're, we have education systems that are working and they're outpacing even the national average, since we don't have a high unemployment rate, we have primarily a workforce that is working and is engaged in, 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 in working. Uh, we needed to be attracting talent. We needed to be attracting talent at a much faster race, pace than we have been. We're growing population, but it just wasn't keeping up with uh, job growth, and it wasn't keeping up with um, where we needed to be. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to dive in here a little bit to talk about some specific tactics and initiatives we used both around developing talent and attracting talent. Uh, so first, um, I'm going to talk about some opportunities we've had to engage in our P16 pipeline. Um, what this is on your screen is a picture from Engineering Day um, that we hosted last year. So what we started to understand was that we needed to do a better job of connecting businesses with those education programs in our community that were developing talent. Um, we started to look at, look at education engineering and architecture as an area where we were experiencing a lot of job growth and started to ask ourselves how well were we retaining that talent in positions in engineering and architecture. And we needed to do a better job of connecting those students with opportunities that were here so they could start to visualize themselves, themselves in careers here in the region. So we hosted Engineering Day, which um, brought together about 500 freshman engineering students from both the University of Nebraska and Lincoln and the University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, we had over 30 employers that engaged in this event um, to help these students visualize what it might be like to have a career in greater Omaha in, in engineering. Um, we planned the day where they toured our downtown. They checked out things like our convention and conference um, center the TD Ameritrade Baseball Park, um, Bob Carey Pedestrian Bridge, all of these projects that those students could potentially have a hands-on experience with if they chose a career um, in our region. So that was, those, that's a tactic that we continue to utilize and focus our engagement in some P16 events when it aligns with targeted industries. <clears throat> and one, if, if you'll just forgive me for jumping in, Sarah, one of the reasons why we our relationships in the educational community showed that there was a lot of folks that dropped out there. And so we were trying to not have them drop out of that track and stay in. And so um, we'll be monitoring that data to see if, if events like this have helped keep more students in that pipeline track for us. Great. So, great. <clears throat> so um, Next, to dive a little bit in a program we use to help attract talent. Um, what we came to found from some of our stakeholder conversations were that a lot of our business community partners were bringing in interns over the summer uh, for internship experiences at their, at their businesses. And typically, the day in the life of that intern was they would um, get up, go to work, engage in the workplace, engage in that internship, and come back and it was really up to them in order 
um, to engage in the community, check out what it was like here, um, you know, take advantage of the summer fun activities that were taking place. And so we started a program to really focus on and target those interns. Um, and since we've been involved in this coming up on five years now, this is one of those programs that we had to stay nimble and flexible with. Um, what we found was we didn't need to be hosting interns at our own events. More so, we needed to be engaging them in the events and activities that were already taking place in our community. So what we end up doing now is throughout quarter one and quarter two every year, we go out to companies and give presentations to um, internship groups and uh, recent hires, young professionals, um, really anybody that's newer in their career or maybe um, in an internship role um, to help expose them to what's going on in the community uh, and then we also capture their contact information, um, social media information so that throughout the summer we can message and market to them um, ways to take advantage of kind of fun things going on in our community throughout the summer. Uh, so we've seen a uh, growth in that program um, and last year when we surveyed all of the engaged participants at the end of the year, 95% um, of them reported that they were somewhat or very likely to accept employment in our region. So we really found that this was a place um, to, to spend some of our resources and time. All right, so um, I promised I would dive a little bit deeper here. Um, so the programs that I've already overviewed, I think, give a broad uh, view of what we could do in general around developing talent or attracting talent. Um, what we found were that there were some specific skill areas that we really needed to place more focus in because um, the amount of talent was so great. Um, it was going to take a pretty concerted effort, a pretty um, coordinated effort uh, to be able to start addressing those skill areas. And so one that we wanted to dive a little bit in is um, tech talent and IT talent. We want to talk to you about um, why we've uh, started an aggressive strategy to address the needs of our business community in this area. So about 18 months ago, a group of businesses came to us and, and started to tell us about the challenges they were experiencing in um, recruiting and retaining IT talent. And um, just like with anything, we wanted to back it up with some data. So we started looking at projected uh, growth in terms of job growth. And then we also looked at completion growth out of our local post-secondary programs. And what we found was uh, projected job growth was going to steadily outpace that of completion. So we simply were not keeping up with demand of the business community in terms of, of developing IT talent. So what we did was we brought together a collection of businesses, education partners, uh, nonprofits to address um, how do we uh, maximize or how do we kind of blow up the, 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 the talent growth that we're seeing in, in and around tech talent. So as you can see, we brought together over 100 uh, community stakeholders. It was a cross-sector group of post-secondary, community <coughs> college, K-12, um, business leaders, HR leaders, CIOs, startups, um, even some elected officials and um, state representatives to come together and and uh, form a strategy collectively to address this need. Um, something that I think is so key in these efforts to realize is that all of our communities probably have some strengths that can and should be leveraged um, and built upon. And with tech talent, that's exactly what we found. So within the greater Omaha community, uh, we found that we had a really strong education infrastructure already in place. Um, we have a, a College of Information Science and Technology here in Greater Alma that produces really strong quality graduates every year, um, somewhere around 120 graduates a year entering the labor force. And um, what we also found was that we had some existing partnerships already in place um, across the region. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we also had a growing economy. So as we look into some of these challenge, these talent challenges, um, it's important to remind your partners and your stakeholders that this is kind of a good challenge to have because we have job growth, we have a growing economy, 
um, that's why we need more of this talent. So it's not always a bad thing or a bad challenge to be facing because we've had so much success. Um, it's kind of why we've, we've, in some ways, created this this opportunity for ourselves to address this. And that was such a key kind of um, stopping point for us to make sure that all of our engaged stakeholders knew because many of our stakeholders represented programs or represented entities that have been working in the IT space of developing IT talent. And it was important for us to keep their engagement and to keep their kind of support of our initiative by not saying that we were recreating the wheel and starting everything over from scratch, but that we, we recognized that there were key strengths in our market and in our community. We just needed to do a better job of kind of harnessing all of those strengths and um, bringing resources to, to the table to grow them even more. So what we found through our, um, our strategic planning was that um, <clears throat> we really rallied behind wanting to increase the number of tech workers in our region in order to keep up with job growth. And so um, our rally cry, or I guess our, our measurable goal that we've all gotten behind is that we will see um, 20,000 trained tech workers by 2020. Um, to put that in a little bit of context or perspective for everybody, um, the data was telling us that we were pacing and we were seeing more of this talent entering our market and developing into the market, but it was just at a much slower pace. So we were increasing by 7 or 8 percent, um, and, and that would be our projected increase by 2020. Um, but with this goal of reaching 20,000 tech workers by 2020, we would um, be seeing about a 30% um, growth in talent. So it's a pretty aggressive goal um, and one to shoot for, but it was one that all of our stakeholders could really rally behind. So how are we going to get there? Um, <clears throat> through the strategic planning and getting a lot of feedback from stakeholders, um, <clears throat> we kind of settled on four major themes of how to address this challenge. Um, and you'll see them up on your screen. Uh, one is just um, getting business and education to collaborate better and, and more together. Um, two, infusing support of early student experiences. If we want to affect the funnel or if we want to affect the pipeline of talent entering our market, we have to start very early on and we have to give more support to those programs that are in place, that are producing great results, but maybe are just um, um, limited by different, by different factors. Three would be help existing talent transition into careers in IT. Um, when I talked about skills mismatch, and we have um, folks in our region that uh, have skills, have jobs, but may not be on a path toward job growth or path toward an area where they can, can continue to move up. Um, we really saw this as an area where we were going to be able to have a lot of impact by providing existing workers kind of that pathway to transition. And fourth would just be telling Greater Omaha's story better. Um, throughout this, it was amazing to pull together stakeholders that have been working on this, this challenge and had been, have been doing stuff but didn't necessarily know of one another, didn't know of each other. Plus, if we were going to be attracting talent from the outside in, um, helping Greater Omaha be known for its tech talent and that this is a place that businesses can grow and um, move to and access phenomenal technology talent in our region was something that we needed to be much louder about um, and really take advantage of. I'm going to provide two specific examples on um, these initiatives that I think will help frame up our work or frame up our story. <clears throat> One is around the area of increasing the communication between business and education. Um, <clears throat> what we found when looking at this was that both of these partners, uh, business and education, want to be successful in this. They want to work together. It's just sometimes they weren't at the same table. Um, they weren't communicating with one another around what they could do in partnership. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a, a recent federal grant program called Tech Hire. Um, it came out through the White House earlier this year where um, communities could apply for funding to provide um, on-ramps for technology careers um, in their region. And, a lot of time, there were a lot of different factors with the applications, but 
it made a lot of sense for different partners like community colleges, um, nonprofits, et cetera, to be applying. Well, what we found was that uh, a lot of our different partners in the region were aware of these opportunities, but weren't always working together to really leverage the system we had in place to um, be best meeting these needs. So what we did was we formed a group to come together and work on the Tech Hire application together under the banner of the Tech Talent Initiative. Um, what we found was, had we not done that, it was likely we were going to have three, four, or five different applications come out from our region. Um, but instead, because we were able to work together, we were able to put forth one um, consistent application from the region uh, that really highlighted the work we could do together. <clears throat> So the second example I wanted to provide um, is around the Boy Scouts. Um, the Boy Scouts in a lot of probably our cities across the country have a program called Explorer Post. And what Explorer Post seems to do is to provide students um, engagement and awareness of careers um, that they can be exploring so that they go on to further education and of course end up in, in a job or career later on in life. <clears throat> the Boy Scouts in our region um, do, do something interesting where they do a career interest survey and throughout the year they actually interview 12,000 middle school students um, and ask them what their career interests might be. And then based upon the feedback that they get, the Boy Scouts organization goes out and sets up explorer posts which are basically like um, kind of uh, day-long engagement workshops where students can go and take part and learn more about maybe a career in engineering or a career in manufacturing um, in the eyes of a business. So a lot of times these are taking place at businesses. Well, what we found was that student interest wasn't necessarily driving um, these experiences taking place in targeted industries. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the, the Explorer posts were in areas that were very interesting but weren't necessarily ones that our region had jobs in. So we've gotten engaged with the Boy Scouts and um, are planning a way for us to, before that career interest survey is, is given, to have a more active role in the schools of helping inform students as well as then their influencers, so parents, counselors, educators, of what jobs and careers exist in our region so that when the students go on to take that career interest survey, they can select careers that they've been told about and are interested in, but then also happen to exist in our region, and um, we can then engage those students with businesses that, that already exist. So uh, we wanted to provide tech talent as an example of where we have dove a little bit deeper in a skill area that we found our businesses were, um, were having a hard time recruiting and retaining talent in. And um, what we've done is um, bring forth the partnership of a lot of different stakeholders in the community to get it done. What we find at the chamber is that's really the best and the only way that we can move forth our goals and accomplish what our mission is, is by bringing in a lot of the partners that um, help make it happen. So um, <clears throat> we wanted to, um, take some time to answer questions that people might have had. Um, we can provide a little bit of data or more specific information on some of the things we've talked about or just field anything that people might be wondering in general. So David, Ann, and I are all available for your questions. Okay, well thank you so much, Sarah, and, uh, and David and Ann. Um, appreciate that presentation, and as indicated, if you all have any questions, um, please go ahead and type them in the question box. They will pop up, I will see them, and I will ask our panel. So um, we start with just, I do have a few questions, and these are sort of general questions about your chamber and your um, and Prosper Omaha. Um, the, and I'll just start at the top. Um, uh, the first question is, how much of a resource is Jim Clifton slash Gallup in your chamber? Well, Gallup, this is David speaking. Uh, Gallup has their Gallup University here, um, which is uh, actually the largest part of the Gallup uh, balance sheet and P&L. They do leadership training for companies around the country, around the world here. And uh, they're a, a, a strong player with our chamber. Uh, they've been involved, actually, Jim Krieger, 
their CFO uh, has been our chairman of the board, and uh, they have many people at Gallup who are involved as, as committee members. Uh, Jim Clifton has been involved with us as both a speaker at our annual meeting um, and a bit of a counselor. Uh, his book, um, Job Cur the, the, job, the Coming Job War, um, has actually been a bit of a Bible for us as we've looked at the role that cities can play in making a difference in the economy moving forward and also the role that uh, cities and regions can play in the whole talent initiative. So um, they're a strong player here in this market. Uh, they're a, a well-known brand, one of the many brands that we're, we're proud to call have a home here in Omaha, but they're very involved with us in a lot of different ways. As, as a chamber, we have embrace their engagement process called Q12 and also their strengths finder uh, process and we use it as a way to um, run our business and develop our culture. So it's a very, very important um, asset for us in that we believe in how they are presenting the notion of engagement and strength and uh, we use it really as the core of our how we actually manage our business. Okay. Um. <laughs> about um, Prosper Omaha. How much was raised in the Prosper Omaha initiative? Uh, we've raised a little more than $24 million uh, for the Prosper Omaha initiative. That's over a five-year period. Um, Prosper Omaha is the fifth iteration of a five-year campaign that started back in the early 90s. Uh, the first iteration was a $5 million campaign over five years. The second campaign was $7.5 million over five years. And then we got aggressive, and the third iteration was 20 million over five years, and then so was the fourth campaign was 20 million. So this most recent one is 24 million. Okay. Um, how do you work with the Omaha CVB? The uh, CVB actually was part of the chamber 20, 30 years ago. Um, it was spun off into, is now a department of the city of Omaha. Uh, the city of Omaha actually pays us to do economic development for them. So while they have the convention and visitors bureau that does tourism and convention attraction, we do all the other work on behalf of the city. Uh, we partner with them on a lot of different things. So we try and have them attract conventions to the market that are consistent with the target industries that we are going after. Um, actually, even our talent initiative uh, the more we can get uh, young people here for engineering conferences or software development conferences or code writing conventions, whatever that might be, we work with them to try and make that happen. Uh, we have some joint marketing, um, although um, I would say that we do, uh, we, are, we are in different enough markets that they are trying to use a little bit different uh, approach than in our Omaha We Don't Coast. Uh, but we partner on community projects a lot and um, we share a lot of information back and forth. So it's a, it's more than an amicable, rela amicable relationship. I'd say it's a partner relationship, um, but they are independent of us and part of the city government here in this market. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, hosting focus groups several times a week. How long did you do that, and how many focus groups were hosted? I think we did that for about six months, and. Uh, you can imagine the number was, you know, well over 25 different groups that we pulled together to talk with and, and ask questions to. And I will add one of the, the areas that I'm not sure Sarah touched on on the focus groups were she, they also took vertical industries and so they looked at manufacturers or and had several conversations or focus groups around specific industries as well as stakeholders in terms of educational institutions or those that were a little bit broader. So they went across groups and then they went vertical and drilled down into groups too. Okay, um, uh, another question about Omaha in general. How many college grads come out of Omaha every year? I don't know that offhand. I don't know that data point offhand. Um, I'll look it up. Yeah, we can we can look it up. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what do your measurements look like that you report on quarterly and annually? Do you know at all if that's specific to talent or 
well, I guess you probably don't know. Um, so, yeah. So, um, really, it's it's a layered a layered reporting system. So we obviously want to track number of participants, number of touch points we're having in these different things, so we can look at a really specific return on the investment. Um, we track number of stakeholders um, engaged in different meetings, number of attendees at events, number of interns, for example, we've presented to. So that's probably bottom level or, or baseline. And then we want to see if we're building upon that and if it's having a greater impact than on overall macro goals. Um, so a next layer might look like we um, ask those participants in the Summer Connector Program um, if they engaged with us, how they engaged with us, uh, if they would select a career here, if they're already um, connected to a, a job or a career here. So we know if, if they're likely to end up in our workforce because of something we've been doing or some interaction they've had. Um, and then macro level um, is, is a great opportunity to track this stuff, but I would say it's not always the easiest to track. But we're obviously interested to know um, if we're meeting job needs. Um, so some ways you can look at that are if your completions out of your education programs are aligning with job growth. Um, we're tracking population, um, knowing if we are growing the overall population and if that ends up happening at a faster pace. And then another key point that I actually didn't talk about much during my presentation, but I think is key here is actually around median wage. Um, you know, we want to ensure that we are attracting talent to meet all of our job needs, but we want to align that talent with where we're seeing job growth. And so understanding where your median wage is and the jobs that you're attracting or developing above median wage and maybe below median wage and how that aligns with then your talent development and attraction has been a key indicator for us as well. So that's kind of a broad answer. I don't know if David has anything to add or not. Yeah, from, so from a talent perspective, you know, we've been building strategy for the past year or so, and I think uh, the 20,000 by 2020 is a good example of how we're at least going to hold ourselves accountable on, on that basis. And we will continue to do more work on the talent side and we continue measuring education output as well, from increasing college graduates, increasing uh, the number of high school graduates, um, reducing the education attainment gap. I mean, all of those things that we measure in our K-12 work and all of our talent workforce work, we measure all the data that's available to make sure it's moving in the right direction. For Prosper Omaha, we also measure, of course, capital investment, uh, jobs created, and compare that against our goals. We've got a goal of $600 million a year in capital investment, as an example. And so we show every quarter what progress we're making on that capital investment goal. We have a goal of 2,500 jobs a year, and so we, we measure uh, the, the goals, uh, the accomplishments that we've made so far until we get to the annual number. Uh, we also measure the number of startups that we've helped get started, the amount of venture capital or angel investment that they pull in, the number of small businesses that we've assisted, the number of retention and expansion calls that we've made. Um, interestingly, on the economic development side, we want to have half of our projects be new companies to the market and the other half be existing companies. And so we measure that as well to make sure that we're being aggressive enough on, on the recruiting and startup side of the house. Um, we also measure work in community development. So we have a, this last couple of years, we've increased the opportunity for a new land bank uh, in this market that we are instrumental in getting started and now we're measuring the outcomes from that land bank. We're also starting now the creation of a certified development intermediary, which will be essentially a financing arm for that land bank. So some of the things that we measure are programmatic. We're creating something that will ultimately help achieve a goal of ours. Um, other pieces of it are, are truly just macro data that we think we want to have you know, some kind of an impact with. So we'll be happy to, to show you what all those measurements are. It's actually on our website. And uh, if, if you want, Susan, we can provide with, for you uh, some of our quarterly report cards that we give to our board and then are distributed to all of our investors every quarter. Yeah, that would be great. I can, um, any information that is helpful, I can post along with the uh, recording on the website as well. Okay, um, terrific. Um, 
uh, next question is, what organization or company completed your analysis and assessment of the data and information regarding the strengths and weaknesses um, with respect to your workforce development? <clears throat> uh, so I would, I would talk about two there. One is Market Street Services in general. Um, they really provide a, provided a big picture assessment. And then um, MZ, which is Economic Modeling Specialist International. Um, provided a more specific industry and workforce analysis. Um, that's where we learned a lot more about the industries that were growing and most likely to grow. And then they helped us understand how workforce lined up with those growing industries. And um, it tells you the, the good, the bad, and the where, where we can focus. So. I think they gave us, EMSI or MC gave us probably the, the best look at the data where we were uh, overproducing in some occupations, underproducing in others, uh, what the gap was going to look like. And so you know, we can tell you right now that there's about 1,400 IT jobs, uh, more 1,400, excuse me, 1,400 more IT jobs available in this market than there are people coming through the pipeline. Um, and it went through about 58 very key occupations that fit within our economy that are crucial to it. And can really tell us the, you know, the, the supply and demand story when it came to each of those different occupations and the industries they serve. So I think that was an eye opener for us and it kind of showed us how, uh, number one, we can be really specific on occupations, but I think the other reason we did the text, text uh, strategy is that it showed that IT is everywhere across virtually every one of these occupations and company types. And so it made sense to kind of deal with that one first since it was going to have the greatest impact across the market. Okay, um, this next question is for, from uh, Chamber Rep who says that uh, she, they're separate from their economic development organization, I guess, but they're heavily in, focused on workforce development. What area would you say is most important to focus on for Chambers to successfully partner with community education and businesses? You know, I, I would, if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I would have said that they were kind of different such different animals that, um, you know, the economic development organization and, and the chamber, its workforce development initiatives could be done maybe parallel with each other. Um, but I think from our experience, we've found that they are so inextricably linked and that the priority for both of them is the same. You cannot be successful, I believe, on a traditional economic development program if you don't have a workforce to fill the jobs that you're creating and retaining. And so I would suggest that, uh, the workforce development work that the chamber is doing and the economic development organization, if they're not joined at the hip, if they're not meeting every day, if their folks don't see each other and talk to each other, if they're not looking at targeted industries and trying to figure out how to meet the labor needs of those, both those being recruited as well as those uh, coming in uh, or existing in the community expanding, then they're probably not going to be as successful as they could be. So. I would suggest that there's a, a joint priority of workforce and economic development. They're, they're so related that you're not going to be successful doing one if you're not doing the other effectively. Okay. Um, does the chamber manage all efforts and workforce throughout the community? For example, coordinating efforts that are happening in silos, bringing together education, educators in public and private sectors from cradle to career, United Way with graduation rates and hurdles for pre-K through 12 students, teacher upskilling, et cetera. If so, how is it managed? Separate board, staff, allocated resources? I can't even imagine the organization that would be in charge of all of the bits and pieces for workforce development. So to answer your question, no, we do not oversee or manage all of those pieces. Um, we very much so have partners in the community like the United Way as well as multiple workforce investment boards that kind of own their own pieces, I guess I would say. Um, what we were able to identify though is what the role of the chamber could and should be. Um, we were able to identify what gaps existed between all of those workforce partners and what they were focused on doing and helping fill in then the gaps. Um, so I mentioned workforce development partners and they're very much um, a tool in this whole conversation. 
Um, we, we have workforce investment boards. We have several, actually, that play a part in our region. And a role that we've taken there is to help strengthen that system of the workforce investment boards working together. So we're not doing the work. We're not actually doing the training. We're not identifying the, the specific needs of the job seekers. But we are helping improve the communication of that system. So all of those partners are not um, basically stopping at county lines, but they are working more together. So that's a role we take. So a lot of what we do is provide the link between all of these other players and the business community. So businesses trust us for because of the agenda that we have. In some cases, they didn't have as strong a relationship with some of the workforce development providers. So a lot of the work that we did to begin with was just to identify what that talent ecosystem looked like, who all the players were in it, uh, what they perceived their roles to be, where there were gaps, and then where we could provide some level of assistance in catalyzing that relationship and bringing catalation, cat excuse me, collaboration aggressively to the table. Now there are some things that we do lead on. Um, we've, we've been leading on a Keep Talent Here initiative that um, identifies uh, folks that might be uh, dislocated from existing companies and be looking for jobs here. So we've taken on a responsibility of providing all of the linkages in, in that scenario. Um, we do a lot of other things that we do at LEAD, I should say, but we don't do any of it alone. So even if we're leading it, we probably have another crop of a dozen organizations that are working with us on the workforce side, because as Sarah said, we don't do training. We don't do education, but we can bring all these different organizations together who do in order to hit the, the goals that we have. Okay. Um, there's two questions relating to attracting talent from outside the region. Um, have you first have you placed any focus on recruiting talent from outside the greater Omaha region? How and who did you partner with to develop an outside recruiting strategy? And the second question is, um, can you share a little more about how you are attracting talent specific to tech from outside the region? Yeah, I would love to talk about both of those. So um, really quickly, I mentioned earlier the landing crew. And when we talk about attracting talent from outside the region, we would love to be out talking to everybody about Greater Omaha and, and, and sharing our message about how much we love working here and the opportunity. But the fact of the matter is we don't have those kinds of resources to do that. So we try to leverage the, um, I guess, the power and the ability of those recruiters who are out talking to people at college fairs and traveling, you know, to, to identify the markets to help us promote the city. So a lot of times they can sell the job, they can sell the company, and we help them sell the city for us. So that's, um, that's one tool or tactic. Specific to tech talent, um, you hit on, I think, what... I think I was going to say before it came out of your mouth, so it would do us no good not to have a strategy around where and how and who we want to attract here. So we can't, we'd spend a lot of money going out and just trying to, you know, advertise and market to everybody to say Greater Omaha is here with probably very little tangible results to tie to that. So um, we had identified tech talent and IT talent, some specific areas that we wanted to attract. And we looked at what markets would make sense to, and the timing of that um, ended up being ripe in that in the Seattle market, um, Microsoft was going through a very, very major um, layoff at the time. Um, and they were, um, a lot of IT talent was departing the company. And so we came up with a targeted strategy um, in the Seattle market to um, start to promote Greater Omaha as a place where they can land a great career doing the things that they loved at our businesses. So we did things like um, we did some guerrilla marketing at different IT and tech conferences there, handing out information about the community. We did search engine as well as social media marketing. Um, some of the things that we loved was our we took kind of a comedic or a lighthearted approach to it and talked about the direct flights from Seattle to Omaha or the number of sunny days that we have compared to Seattle or the size of house people could purchase here versus Seattle, all for you know having the same level of career, career opportunities that they would get in our market. And so that was something specific we did for tech talent. Okay, uh, you mentioned the landing crew. 
Uh, do, does the landing crew continue to get together on a regular basis, and if so, how often? So we do a bunch with that crew. So on a regular basis, the landing crew gets together monthly um, to kind of build capacity. Um, you know, they talk about things that probably help them in their day-to-day, -day, like applicant sourcing, um, applicant tracking systems, uh, utilizing LinkedIn as a resource to find candidates. But then we invite them four times a year to uh, what we call prepare for landing training. And what we do is we try to provide them information about how to sell the region. So we posted um, those on the arts and music. So we brought in a bunch of arts organizations to talk about the opera or talk about the symphony or talk about there was a hip hop festival last summer. So that as those recruiters are out selling our mark, they're selling the job and they're selling the company, but they may not have the information about the community and we wanted to make sure they knew where to go and where to get it. Um, and so we bring them together four times a year to conduct that training. Okay, um, how many people on your staff are involved in the efforts that you've talked about today? Well, um, I would, there are four members of the talent team specifically, but then, um, you know, David and Anne are both involved in our talent efforts. Our economic development team in general are promoting programs or, um, you know, connecting businesses with opportunities. And then, of course, our, our marketing team as well has a really big role to play in how we're marketing the region, how we're marketing jobs, that kind of stuff. So, so the Omaha We Know Co stuff you see on the screen um, is uh, part of our regional branding initiative and it's become a major part of our talent initiative, whether it's uh, advertising on billboards or uh, doing social media, or we actually have a, one of our staffers who does the intern work is also going to be on college campuses you know, this fall, I think, doing, doing some recruiting. Uh, and we'll use the We Don't Coast um, slogan as a way to let people know what we do here. So. Um, it's a, there's four people doing the, the talent stuff day to day, every day, but there's a large group of people that provide support to them as well. All right. Um, so we have one final question that relates back to the focus groups that you talked about before. Um, do you have the same programming, or I guess same questions for each focus group, or was it tailored to each audience? Yeah, it was absolutely tailored to each audience. I mean, there were specific things we wanted to learn from each audience, and I would say one focus group leads to the other. When we started connecting with senior HR leaders and they said they had a challenge attracting IT talent, we then for sure wanted to talk to IT talent and say, what works, what doesn't, why would you take a job in Omaha, why wouldn't you? So um, the programming and questions and kind of format of those focus groups took a different shape every time. And I think if you're listening well and asking the right questions, it kind of leads you down a path to the, to the next. All right. Well, that is all the questions we have. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to um, David and Ann and Sarah for that great presentation and for um, the discussion afterwards. And thanks to all of you for your participation. Um, just a reminder that the webinar is, was recorded and uh, I will post that recording along with a copy of the presentation um, on our ACC webinar page within the next one to two business days. And um, you can find that by clicking on our, on our website, www.acce.org, click on professional development, then on ACC University Online, and then A to Z webinars. It should be there along with all of the rest of the webinars that we have presented over the past um, long period of time. Um, also, just to let you know, our next ACC webinar will be on Thursday, May 5th. Um, we will present another session in our series of Chamber of the Year Award winners. Um, the webinar will be presented by Susan Phillips, Director of Marketing of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce, who will discuss um, their chamber's collaboration with the Myrtle Beach International Airport to develop a long-term program to expand air service options for visitors, businesses, and residents. So thank you again so much to the Omaha Chamber leadership for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for your participation and interest. And I wish all of you a wonderful afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.